Hello and welcome back to the Crime Reel. For today's true crime narration, we shall be looking at the troubled life of James French and, ultimately, his campaign to die in the electric chair. Irrespective of views on the existence of the death penalty, which has always been a very divisive subject, I'd be really interested to hear your thoughts as to whether a convicted murderer who has admitted their crimes and been sentenced to death should have lengthy and costly legal appeals completed against their wishes. So, to begin with, here are the details of James's life and crimes. He was born in Illinois on the 16th of June 1938 and was adopted by Clinton and Helen Fox when he was just 19 days old. It is believed that he grew up in Peoria, Illinois, along with a sister named Jean. Newspaper reports detail a life of crime that began when he was just five years old when he stabbed a man who he thought was hassling his mother. By the age of eight, he had attempted to set fire to his school and was committed to three separate psychiatric hospitals over the following years, all of which declared him to be sane. After spending 19 months in a federal reformatory in Ohio as a result of forgery charges, he decided to try his luck as an auto racer in California. However, he was soon barred from the sport and labelled a psychotic track killer. During his various incarcerations, he completed both his high school education and two years of post-secondary education. He also wrote a book called We, which was about crime compulsion. In December 1957, when James was 20, having not long been released from prison, he was hitchhiking near Amarillo, Texas, when he was picked up by a passering motorist, Franklin R. Boone, who was from Morgantown, West Virginia. Sometime later, James walked into a service station in Knoll, Missouri, and asked the attendant to clean blood off the front seat of his car. The attendant notified the police, and a four-state alarm was broadcast. James was arrested just 15 minutes later. When questioned, James told the police that Franklin had stopped to give him a lift and he discovered that Franklin had 2,000 US dollars in government bonds. At this point, James pulled out his pistol and told Franklin to keep driving and that he was going to force Franklin to cash the bonds. Franklin refused, so James shot him in the head, dumping his body near a farm near Stroud in Oklahoma. Franklin was just 25 years old. James claimed to be not guilty by reason of insanity, but after he was classified as sane following psychiatric evaluations, he changed his plea to guilty. He was later quoted as saying that he had repaid Franklin's kindness with a bullet. I didn't have to kill him to take his money, but there are violent impulses in violent men. I'm one of them. At a non-jury trial in 1959, James requested that he be sentenced to death. However, apparently because of a deal entered into between the prosecutor and James' court-appointed public defender, he was instead given a sentence of life in prison. James did not agree with this sentence and wrote several letters to the governor requesting a new trial in which he could receive a death sentence. The letters went unanswered and the life sentence stood. He was sent to the Oklahoma State Penitentiary in McAllister, where he was placed in a cell with 27-year-old Eddie Lee Shelton. Frustrated by the lack of progress in getting his life sentence changed to the death penalty, James decided to take matters into his own hands. In October 1961, James decided that it was time for his cellmate, Eddie, to die. He deemed that Eddie should be allowed a last meal, and he took Eddie to the prison canteen where he treated him to a steak sandwich. James decided to allow Eddie one more night and once Eddie returned to the cell after breakfast the following morning, James wrapped a towel around his neck and strangled him until he was unconscious. He then finished the job by tying his shoelaces tightly around Eddie's neck. 
James knew exactly what he was doing. He immediately confessed to his crime and explained that he had murdered Eddie because he was stupid and refused to shape up, and would later say that Eddie wasn't fit to live. He deserved to die, and now because of what I did, I deserve to die too. I don't want to die. Who does? But the rules are clear. To take a life is to forfeit your own. Now facing a trial for a second murder, he again asked to be sentenced to death and requested that the judge deny all future appeals because he wanted to die in the electric chair. James went on to state how he had committed the murder in order to compel the state of Oklahoma to execute him. This time he got his wish and in October 1962, the judge imposed a sentence of death. However, there were more legal wranglings to come. Against his wishes, James' attorneys argued that he should be granted a new trial due to the jury at the first one seeing James in shackles, which may have negatively impacted their perception of him. James wrote a letter to the three-person high court in which he said, It is not my want or desire to appeal the sentence of the court, and went on to say, You see, gentlemen, I am an honest and just man, and sincerely feel that the verdict was, considering all circumstances, a just one and one that should be upheld. He added that, Not only am I a just man, but a man of courage and principle, a man who believes in the law and its application in the fullest extent of the word. I judged, and it is only fitting that I too should be judged. Nevertheless, the new trial was granted and, once again, James was sentenced to death. However, after this second trial, his attorneys argued that the judge who had presided had given an improper response to a juror's inquiry regarding exactly what life imprisonment meant. As a result, a third trial would take place. James denounced the actions of the Court of Appeals, saying that they were wasteful, useless and prolonged the inevitable. This third trial took place in 1965, during which James, a man who wanted to be viewed as intelligent, quoted a poem that he had written. An insane sound, an insane light. Who can say what is wrong or right? Words the only bitten air. Life itself but a fleeting affair. Yet again, James was sentenced to death and an appeal was lodged. This time the appeal was unsuccessful, not least because James had written to the Oklahoma Court of Appeal asking them to reject all future legal efforts made to save his life. Whilst on death row, James was subjected to numerous psychiatric tests and was shown to have above average intelligence. These tests also revealed that he had been suicidal for a long time and had made serious attempts to take his own life in the past but had never been able to see this through. During one of his assessments, he asked a doctor to hypnotise him before his execution to find out what is wrong inside of me and let me know. By the time his execution was confirmed, the death penalty in the US was virtually at a standstill due to changing attitudes. It was eventually suspended from 1972 until 1976. However, due to James' aggressive pursuit of this punishment, he ended up being the last person executed under Oklahoma's death penalty laws before the capital punishment suspension. He was also the only person executed in the US in 1966. At 10 p.m. on August 10th, 1966, 30-year-old James finally got his wish. He walked calmly to the execution chair wearing a black suit, dark tie and black shoes. He shook hands with the governor before sitting in the electric chair. A reporter present commented that he faced death with the same cockiness he faced life. When asked if he had any final words, he replied, everything had already been said. In a final interview in the days before his death, he leant over to reporter Bob Gregory and said, if I were covering my execution, do you know what I'd say in the newspaper headline? French fries. At all three of his trials, James made a full voluntary statement where he confessed to Eddie's murder. He clearly stated that his motive for murdering his cellmate was to force the state to execute him for his crimes. 
something which he felt entitled to and clearly wanted. Despite that, numerous appeals were launched, taking a huge toll on relatives of the victim and also a massive financial toll on the state. James clearly killed in order to be executed, so was it right that he got his wish? Would a better punishment have been to leave him in prison for the rest of his life? Or should the execution have been performed as soon as it was initially agreed to avoid further distress and waste of time and resources? As always, I'll be fascinated to hear your opinions in the comments section below. That concludes today's case. If you're new to the channel, please subscribe. We're so close now to the 100,000. Is it ever going to happen, I wonder? Thanks very much for listening to The Crime Reel. Stay safe. Goodbye. Psst. I tried to find out James's last meal, and I am unable to confirm or deny if it included French fries. Goodbye.